very good morning to you all and thanks very much for attending today this webinar on engaging with customers in vulnerable situations apologies for the slight delay we've had a couple of technical issues so unfortunately you won't be able to see sarah hopkins from wales and west utilities today but you can see her screen sharing and you will be able to hear her so that's good news um, we're holding this webinar because I, I think now more than ever it's important for businesses to reflect the views of their customers and the communities that rely on them. Too often though, those living in vulnerable situations are overlooked and engagement method methods made to fit, resulting in a sort of uh, devoid um, insight with, with little actions and depth that you can actually act on. So today we're going to be hearing from Wales and West Utilities and Mindset Research, who have together launched a guide to engage with the most vulnerable in our society. And as uh, we've entered lockdown two uh, this morning in England, I know you've been in lockdown in Wales for the past couple of weeks, I think that um, the focus on the vulnerable is more important than ever. There will be opportunities to ask questions throughout the session, so you can email me directly with your questions. I'm louise.stuart, you can see my name on the screen there, ew, at cicero-group.com. That's cicero-group.com. But I'm now going to hand over to Sarah Hopkins from Wales and West Utilities. She's the People and Engagement Director, and she will introduce uh, the company, Wales and West Utilities, and outline why supporting the most vulnerable is so important to them. Sarah. Thanks, Louise, and good morning, everybody. I do apologise also for my technical failure this morning. I've done my hair and makeup as well, especially uh, to join you today, but uh, that's all going to go to waste now. I'll try and get it working perhaps before the, the panel discussion uh, later on. Um, thanks also, uh, just to echo Louise's thanks for to you guys for joining us this morning for the launch of our research guide on engaging with customers in vulnerable situations jointly produced with Mindset Research. For those of you that um, don't know a lot about us, I thought I would take the opportunity to um, just share a little bit about who Wales and West Utilities are and um, what we do. So um, without further ado, um, Wales and West Utilities are a gas distribution network. We supply gas to two and a half million homes and businesses across Wales and the southwest of England, serving a population of seven and a half million people. In our work, obviously, we come across consumer vulnerability every day because we provide a 24-hour-a-day, um, seven-day-a-week service across 365 days a year. Most importantly, the reason for that 24-hour um, service is the fact that we are the gas emergency provider. So if you live in our network and you smell gas in your home or your property, you ring the gas emergency number and one of our engineers will come and make your property safe. But that's not all we do. Uh, as indicated on the slide, we also connect new customers to the gas network every year, about 11,000 uh, new customers. And we also uh, look after the gas pipeline network um, across Wales and the southwest of England. And believe it or not, we have 35,000 kilometres of gas pipes underneath the ground, which if you lay them end to end, would stretch from our head office in Newport in South Wales down to New Zealand and back. And we look after those pipes, making sure that um, they are relayed and that they are fixed when they crack. And to do that, we invest uh, more than two million pounds a week in the gas network to keep our the gas flowing, keep our customers safe and keep them warm in their homes. Certainly in the winter, it's been a bit chilly here in Cardiff over the last couple of nights. And to do that, we've got more than 1,500 colleagues uh, based all around our network from Anglesey down to Red Roof in um, Cornwall that uh, attend those gas escapes, lay those gas pipes and make those new connections as well as all the things behind the scenes to make that work. As I said, in our work, we come across consumer vulnerability every day. And as you can imagine, with the work that we do, particularly in um, gas escapes and mains replacement, we're actually meeting with people in or around their homes. So we've got a very good insight into consumer vulnerability. And because of that, we have a range of support services that we provide to customers when their service is disrupted and um, to help them, as, as well as I said, to keep safe and warm in their homes. Nigel, uh, my colleague, will tell you more about that um, shortly. 
and in particular in our area we've got some significant areas of deprivation and consumer vulnerability and on the slide that you can see now I just thought I would share with you some broad statistics around consumer vulnerability in our area so I'm not going to uh, read them all through I'm sure you can all, all read them for yourself but just to highlight some obviously we've got um, quite a high proportion of people of pensionable age as, as an example with one and a half million in our operating region we've got um, nearly 200,000 people with learning disabilities uh, as another example 460,000 homes um, that we estimate in our area that are in fuel poverty and I guess um, some of the other things that have been more emerging in our work on consumer vulnerability and I know Martin will talk about this in a, in a short while are things around mental health and we've got um, one in, in six people uh, in our area as is common across the whole of the UK uh, experiencing a common mental health problem every week and that is something that definitely is more emerging in the work that we are doing and the people that we meet. So um, why have we done some research and why have we produced a guide? Well, we don't send customers bills. We're not a gas supplier. That's done by the gas suppliers. We are the gas distributor and the emergency service. So in order to find out a little bit more about who our customers are and what they need and want from us and that when we are working in their street or their home or their area, we need to rely on insight and research to find out more about them. And as we've just seen on the slide, information on vulnerability that's um, produced um, more nationally can be broad brush or impersonal. So in our line of work, we really wanted to understand what vulnerability means for the people that we serve across our network. And actually, the specific trigger um, for, for this piece of work was our regulatory price review. So we wanted to know more about our, um, our customers in the lead up to putting together our regulatory business plan for our price control review, which our regulator Ofgem run, which looks at uh, what work we're going to deliver over a period and uh, how much money we get to do that. And our next price control review starts on the 1st of April 2021. So we worked with Mindset in preparation for that as a, a research project, looking at, um, a, over quite a long period, a project looking at uh, vulnerable customers and their needs and circumstances. And, and with that, we, we obviously work with, with Mindset. So we know that other organisations such as um, those that you represent that have joined today will want to engage with people living in vulnerable situations. And we hope that this guide um, gives a new perspective on um, the methodology that we used along with Mindset, but also give you guys an, an insight into a few of our high level findings and hopefully you'll find those interesting. As Louise said, please um, do ask questions. Uh, we'll be um, very happy to answer them in the panel question and answer session uh, in a short while. And I'll just hand back to Louise now, but it just leaves me to say, enjoy the session today and I, I hope you find it interesting. Thank you, Louise. Thank you very much, Sarah, for those insights. Um, really interesting, actually. Um, I'll now hand over to Martin Olver from Mindset Research. Now, he's going to talk us through some of the key findings of the guide. Um, also, there will be an opportunity to hear directly from some of the people involved in the research. Uh, remember, if you do want to ask a question throughout the session, you can do so by emailing me uh, with those questions, louise.stuart at cithero-group.com. Um, but for now, I'll hand over to Martin. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, the good news or bad news, I guess, pro probably in your case, is I think my webcam is working, so you are able to see me. Um, as um, Sarah talked about there, we've conducted extensive research and, and the guide we've prepared is based on a, a considerable programme of research. I have about 15 minutes here to share um, some insights from that. Uh, I can really only scratch the surface just to highlight a few points about the, the nature of the guide and also the research we conducted. The guide is in two parts. So the first part of the guide talks in detail about our engagement programme or about specifically about the consultation programme with customers in vulnerable situations and um, other um, audiences with an interest in, in, in and with uh, insights on, on that audience. The second part of the guide pulls out some more general learnings. We thought it was sensible to share um, 
given the pain we'd been through through, through the, the various stages to make sure the program uh, was fit for purpose uh, and, we're, and we believe very much that it, it, uh, it, it was that we thought it was sensible to share um, insights with uh, with people about how we believe you should go about engaging with customers in vulnerable situations or at least some of the lessons we learned. Let's briefly talk you through um, what we did. Uh, this was a staged approach, a multi-phase program, uh, actually spanning the course of probably about 18 months. We started back in 2018 um, and the fieldwork, the research fieldwork finished late in 2019, although we have still been working on findings and, and interpreting and analysing since that time. The importance of the phases really can't be overstated here. The first phase was very much about presenting people in, in vulnerable situations or potentially in vulnerable situations and other, um, other uh, uh, audiences with insights, um, useful insights, with a blank page. We didn't want to go to these audiences and say, okay, this is what Wales and West Utilities offer, is it right for you? We we turned that on its head, we went to vulnerable audiences, we said we want to understand all we can about you and then we will we'll develop what Wells and West Utilities believe they should offer to support um, to support you on the basis of, of what we told you. So hence phase one was all about uh, presenting people with an opportunity to explain their needs, their circumstances, their backgrounds, the influences, the factors which affect their everyday lives and specifically potentially affect operations um, uh, undertaken by Wells and West Utilities. We quickly moved to a second phase where from the first phase some concepts and some support measures and initiatives were developed, we tested those. Some of those were already in place, some of them uh, emerged directly from the findings of the first phase. The final phase, phase three, um, was an opportunity to revisit the concepts uh, and the support measures which have been which have been uh, developed over the course of the first two waves, refining them and actually looking at them in the context of um, Wells and West Utilities draft uh, business plan for 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 the uh, price control period moving forward, which um, which Sarah talked about just now. I can't go into too much detail about what we did. This was essentially a qualitative approach, so we were talking to. Uh, to audiences in depth. This isn't a quantitative survey, or in most respects, we, we did a, a small kind of a customer telephone survey at phase one. In most respects, we are talking about qualitative research, which um, for various reasons, and these are all explained in the guide, took the form of one-to-one -one interviews with vulnerable uh, people in vulnerable situations, mostly or almost exclusively in their own homes, guided by discussion guides, but very um, uh, 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 very able to adapt to um, uh, uh, to the, the the direction in which each interview was taken. Um, with uh, we also spoke to professional carers um, uh, because we thought that, that it would be useful to have insights into their client base, their perspective on vulnerability and potential vulnerability and also it would give us access to some audiences which would be difficult for us to to research directly so for example um, uh, some individuals uh, wouldn't be able to, to talk to us or wouldn't feel comfortable talking to us we might not be able to talk to people with learning um, uh, disabilities or uh, or dementia and so on and so forth so we spoke to uh, to, to professional carers um, just a few more points about what we did here so uh, at each stage uh, considerable numbers of, uh, of depth interviews. We used a small interviewing team because we thought it was important for all of us uh, to, to for, for some continuity to run through the programme. Some very quick points before, excuse me, before I move on. Um, we are uh, we spoke to we spoke to um, uh, customers in vulnerable situations on a one-to-one -one basis. Carers were slightly different and we needed to be uh, flexible and adaptable and speak to them in, in ways that made sense. In lots of cases, we ended up uh, running mini focus groups or paired depths or triads simply because we had to fit in with their schedules with their, uh, with their often anti-social hours. So, so we, we, we fitted around their needs and, and, and circumstances. Um, some individuals, took part in more than one stage, and that was a conscious decision. Um, we used local recruiters to recruit our sample, market research recruiters with specialist knowledge and, and, and experience in recruiting. 
the important point here is all of those recruiters uh, were part of the communities that they were recruiting from, so they had good knowledge, um, and the recruitment process is, is very, very important. I should also say we incentivize, we offered cash incentives. Uh, there's nothing uh, cheap or, or, or dirty about offering cash incentives, we believe. It does two things. It, it rewards people and validates what they have to say to us. Uh, it, uh, lots of these people aren't perhaps used to to having their views listened to. So, 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 so by listening to them, giving them the time to speak and also rewarding them, it validated what they had to say. Also, by paying incentives, it widens inclusivity because we can get to speak to some people who ordinarily wouldn't perhaps be the first to put their views forward. What I'd like to do now very briefly uh, is share with you um, some uh, very, very brief clips from, uh, first of all, some of the care interviews and secondly, the customer interviews. Bear with me, the, these jump about a bit, we've dipped in and out, but it will hopefully give you an insight into the type of conversations we had and some of the issues as well. Mainly with people like with dementia, for instance, mm -hmm. I work when, with one lady and she was asked to have no from the house to remind her that we're coming. So for her to be without gas and do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but she has this like four times a day and that she's fine. Yeah. She's just sort of um, like forgetful. Yeah. Or she'll like she knows we're coming, but it's, it's the time we've gone, even ten minutes she's on the phone and are they coming? Where's my carer? Like, so she, she gets anxious about stuff. Really well. anxious. Yeah. Like she writes down if like the different carer have come, she'll cross the name out, write my name. So she likes again, they like continuity and if that was to happen to her, she would literally probably lose it. And because she wouldn't remember by a letter. So then she'd be all stressed and work because she obviously has a shower as well every morning at a certain time. She wouldn't know what was going on, so we'd really get her to stress. But then I feel like she'd be, need more of a, a day, estimate of time rather than just it's going to be off at this in May or, you know, yeah. like you said. you said because then it would help her in, in that day as you know maybe it could be left on a board or something and then she's obviously seeing it every day so then if it was to happen she could see that herself yeah. and be like oh that's why because it's so then because then the family would know for instance they could put it up on a board and she yeah. even if that day she it comes when she forgot she would see it and yeah. know so then she'd be like it's okay it's been okay. for so long but it would cause issues because the you know they, they become very vulnerable even more than what could be cold yeah but then we have had one actually when i don't know who supplied it but it was done for a social worker knew the gas was going to be off and they supplied little electrocutors and so, i think when that comes as well to um establish how much she will be spending on electric after that because yes she won't be paying for gas um you know she won't be using it but Electrical, you would cost her more. That sort of thing would be a good idea if, if there was a letter. Because in the back of our service users' okay. folders for the eight weeks, we have things like um, fire service, yeah. free fire service, food, um, stuff, um, complaints, all those sort of things. Well, yeah, the and things like that. Yeah. And um, also when they can get the, the fixing done on their care and repair, care and repair and things like that. So we put those things in there and then people read through those in the six weeks and we end up saying these things in the air yeah. and we tell the families. No, if they were in an area, say the Long Cross or whatever, this, this area, could they ring up uh, a social services group or a social work group and say, is there any vulnerable adults that you know of in this area because we are going to be doing this work and we need to let yeah. um, the social work know? Because no, they, they may need extra time or on the lunchtime when they don't, can't use the cooker because yeah. it's like a gas cooker and they need to prepare their meals and yeah. we will be call to them to bring the news from somewhere or buy and yeah. prepare it and yeah. get that's organized beforehand we would have to know the exact day or time so if they're occupier some service users who haven't got family would not even open that letter and they wouldn't be able to to give you that information yeah. so i think sometimes it's better going through instead of the letter as a flyer 
a letter and a flyer. So one for the family, but a, a, something in bold print saying this, this is, is what it is. Yeah. yeah, and if they can't pick it up and read it, somebody who comes to visit can see it in well, the yeah, print. Just and just especially if it says Wales and West, we don't know who they are. The service users probably don't know. Have you heard of something, have any of you heard of something called the Priority Services Register? No. no. Well, the only thing I can think of that reminds me a bit of the flagging service. Mm -hmm. It is a sort of a flagging service. Yes. We do use a flagging service. So how does, that, how does that work for you? Well, because we, we're vulnerable, they're vulnerable. Um, so if anything comes up as a warning, it's flagged. And when you check why, there's a warning on the property. As for that, who has to register it? Would it be the service user or would it be your family? If we as the parents don't know that, it's yes. Because if we don't, how they will. Uh, apologies, I think there was a slight interruption to the audio there. I think that was probably my fault. I will I will play a selection of clips from some of the interviews with uh, with vulnerable, uh, potentially vulnerable customers now. These jump in and out of, of subject, but again, it's just to give you a feel for the type of people we spoke to, the nature of the conversations and, and the type of insights um, we, we uncovered. Mr. Drive there too. Uh, I just had more plants are taken up. Oh, really? Yeah, which was nasty off. Mm. Um, I, I go to the lymphedema clinic because I go swelling. Right. And to Glamorgan House, manage on my own. I yeah. have a lady come in three hours a week, enough time for them to help me um, with heating if it was the winter, you know, a little bit of time to help. That would be the, the main thing. I was a um, marine surveyor okay. and uh, uh, put a royal property dock. Um, and um, I uh, spent a short time going and doing a bit of DIY on the kitchen. And we were up at DQ, and my ball, my my socket actually shattered, and my ball went up through. Oh, and what happened? Uh, it was a, a, a car accident in '71. But since then, I've always had a limp and everything. Um, since '98, since my wife was diagnosed with um, an E disease, oh, yeah. fibromyalgia, yeah. and she's also bipolar, so she right. had a lot of mental illnesses. I gave up work in 1992 and became a full time carer. And she said, I have three children, we do spend more time in the house, yeah. but um, she does have a lot of appointments um, with different professionals. So our life is based around taking the little one to school yeah. and then during the day um, hospitals, psychiatrists, doctors, yeah. Yeah. all sorts. I was a single yeah. mum unfortunately, yeah. um, not by choice really, yeah, yeah really tough. Um, yeah I, well, I work, I did work full time obviously now I'm returned to leave so my finances have hit a bit of a knot, really That's have cool. anywhere to go. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that, yeah. I don't really know how I would deal with that. Yeah. Um, because I'd need to, I wouldn't be able to stay here really because keeping like a baby warm is really important. Yeah, yeah. Um, feeding and things and yeah, him having a bath and yeah, okay. heating water, yeah. yeah okay. would I, So I actually don't know what I would do because I would need to find somewhere else yeah. to go. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I don't know how I would afford it, but would be to go and stay maybe in a, I don't know, a travel lodge or okay. something for the night. Any analysis? Oh, right, okay. So that kidney dialysis. Yes. Right. I've been going down there now for years. Three times a week Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That I, I, I guess picked up by ambulance. Uh, uh, are you fit and well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, you've got to say you're fit and well. Because I, I, I work 20 some odd years underground. I'm your minor. Yeah. Ah, yeah. And then you go 65%. No money horses. I just have to go and get an extra blanket or something. <laughs> have you ever heard of anything called the priority services register? No. Okay, so that is a, a, a brief taste of, 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 of the, the type of interviews we conducted. What, what you mostly heard there is, is carers and um, individuals in, in vulnerable situations talking about their circumstances and to an extent uh, thinking about that in the context of, of Wales and West utilities and their operations um, and perhaps how they might impact them. Clearly we, we dug a lot deeper but I just wanted you to hear a, a kind of a, a selection of, a, of some of the circumstances and some of the issues people face. Um, we will move on to briefly um, think about um, some of the key findings. 
I would urge you to read the report when, when, when you download the link to the report. There is an awful lot of detail on, on the findings here. I'm really scraping the surface here. Just, just some of the very, very high level findings, um, and, and I'm conscious of time, so I'll move through these very quickly, but I just wanted to, to pull out some of, the, some of the key learnings. First one actually is about the priority services register and the lack of familiarity and awareness. You heard that referred to um, on a number of occasions during those clips, both amongst the uh, people in vulnerable situations and, and also carers, professional carers, unaware of, uh, of a priority services register for Wells and West Utilities or for indeed uh, a gas supplier or, or indeed uh, water, uh, for example. There was a, a, a consensus uh, a, a, across the, the audiences that a, a key priority must, to, must be to raise the profile of, of the priority service services register so so people in these situations can be flagged second point uh pre uh, presence and impact of emotional vulnerability we've, we've talked about emotional vulnerability here rather than mental health i'm not qualified i think to to, to categorize somebody in terms of mental health or, or suffering from mental health a number of individuals of course talked about that in, uh, a, 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 and had their own diagnosis and told us about that but we are here talking mostly about emotional vulnerability uh, um, emotional vulnerability which was perhaps unexpected often linked to lots of the other more visible and tangible tangible vulnerabilities that we'd recruited these individuals on the basis um, of representing in terms of the work we were doing for Wells and West Utilities very very significant uh, implications and impacts uh, individuals real there's a generalization but often individuals really don't like changes to routines and become very anxious even if they know a change to routine um, is, is imminent um, even if it in our minds that might seem an apparently minor um, uh, impact on on their daily lives very very significant finding um, and we were uh, went to great lengths to explore that with wealth and west utilities and its its implications in terms of case management communication uh, and so on. Um, this tendency of thinking about vulnerability in, in binary terms, we're kind of falling into that trap today almost. We're talking about people in, in, in potentially vulnerable situations. It's inevitable. However, even amongst these individuals we spoke to who we'd, we'd classified as being potentially vulnerable, lots of discussion about how vulnerable they were. We had plenty of individuals, including that gentleman at the end, actually, who claimed not to be vulnerable. He was undergoing weekly dialysis or, or, or several times a week. Uh, he suffered from COPD or a similar condition uh, and lots of other potential uh, disadvantages and yet he made light of it um, so it's useful to talk to the carers about actually where they where, where vulnerability really um, kicks in and, and really can have an effect even when when the individuals thems, individuals themselves perhaps don't admit to it um, the fourth point uh, I'd like to make here uh, uh, just before moving on is about um, the extent to which actually when we told individuals about what Wells and West Utilities already do, people were surprised and very pleased in most cases and often the measures which individuals were calling for at that first phase, at that blank phase of research, when we asked them actually what, what, what need and uh, what um, support would they need, what, what initiatives and measures might be appropriate, many of the, uh, the measures they were calling for were already in place. The issue was they didn't know about it and it was very, very likely that they weren't flagged as vulnerable because they weren't on the uh, priority services register. So those the measures which Wells West Utilities already had in place weren't reaching the right people. Um, and finally, just before we move on, um, lots of discussion. This was an interest, interesting discussion about how far an organisation, in this case Wells and West Utilities, should go in supporting um, vulnerability. Um, difficult to summarise here, there is some discussion of this in the report, but essentially um, the individuals we spoke to by and large talked about it's important that Wells and West Utilities should focus first on supporting those who are most in need in the context of its core operations. So for example, when uh, or when there's pipe replacement work and there may be disruptions to, to, to households or to neighbourhoods, that is when they should be supporting the vulnerable. Lots of discussions, and this is, a, is an interesting and potentially highly uh, contentious point, I think. Lots of people were slightly concerned that uh, a, 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 a kind of a big brother mentality or an organization um, overstepping the mark and, and moving into into the realms of well I guess what they would they would think of as being social work so it's an, it's an interesting discussion and one that formed part of, uh, of, the, of the conversations we had uh, just moving on um, 
I won't dwell on on this too much. This is simply talking about the ideal scenario from, from, from customers' perspective. We talk here about what people told us. Uh, we talk about the priority services register. We talk about how people would like, uh, how individuals in, uh, taking part in research would like Wells and West Utilities to develop a strategy. So, so, so very simply here, people were saying that the key points of this is you mustn't take a generic approach. Everyone is different. Uh, vulnerability comes in many, many forms. Uh, communications and, and case management is as important as the measures that you have in place. Um, it's inevitable that you will need to prioritise. These these potentially vulnerable people were telling that uh, were telling us that themselves. You will have to prioritise because there will be people who are more vulnerable than others, and it's important to have a means of identifying that. So therefore, that the, their thinking on on the on, on how this can be implemented is. Uh, in an ideal world, and I have no idea whether this is possible or uh, or, or workable in any way, but the, the, the priority service register could, could could form the pivot here of all of the information that you need to collect. It becomes uh, both a means of flagging vulnerability, but also um, a, 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 a means of collecting information about individuals on, on, on a very bespoke basis. So you would have information about uh, the nature of the vulnerabilities, their preferences in terms of, uh, uh, of communication and contact ahead of, during and after any operations, particularly in the context of that, the point we were making about emotional vulnerability. I have no idea whether that is a possibility and it sounds to me as though uh, that, 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 that presents many, many challenges. We're just, we're just uh, setting that out there as uh, the, um, the, 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 the desired approach or the absolute ideal approach that, that, that our audience has identified. Very, very quickly then moving on. Um, we just uh, we just want to share uh, 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 this 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 mostly now talks about the second part of the guide, which moves away specifically from the Wells and West Utilities research and talks about what we learned from uh, going through these many phases of research, what we learned, what we'd like to share with you, what we what we, what we feel is important in, in um, uh, designing. Um, consultations and engagement with, with, with audiences in potentially vulnerable situations very quickly from, from, from the start here. It's important to define, to define vulnerability but have a flexible view on that. Um, there are many definitions of vulnerability. We started from an off-gen perspective, also from eligibility criteria from the Priority Services Register, but it, 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 it uh, expanded and broadened beyond that. Uh, our research uh, took in a very diverse diverse audience and as I say vulnerability comes in many many forms. The staged approach was important because we developed and we evolved and we learned as we moved on and if we made a mistake in terms of how we went about research at one stage we could correct that uh, for, for the, for the uh, consequent uh, 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 stages of the program. Scope, scope and scale is important, this was an extensive program of research, it focused purely on these audiences, people potentially in vulnerable situations. Uh, this wasn't kind of an add-on to a general customer satisfaction survey, it was uh, dedicated and extensive. We consulted beyond the audience, we consulted with, I haven't talked too much about this, we consulted with professional carers, we did go outside the audience, we talked to, for example, care and the pair case workers. That was as important in many ways as the interviews with uh, people in vulnerable situations. And we took a, 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 an audience-led approach. We had no pre preconceptions about how to go about this, about how to undertake the interviews, even to the point that when you would arrive at an interview, we were mostly guided by the circumstances that uh, that, that we met when, when, when we arrived at that interview. And that is that's important. We feel in, in, in research and disorders. Finally, and I, I really probably have talked too long and. Uh, I've, I've cut into other people's time, so I'll work through these very quickly. At the back of the guide, you, you will see this um, this summary replicated. We're talking here about some some points to consider. We're not saying this is necessarily the right way to to do things. Just some lessons that we learned that we would like to share with you at different stages of of, of uh, consulting. First of all, defining uh, two points there. Think about potential vulnerability in the broadest sense, both in terms of circumstantial vulnerability and also transient vulnerability. You heard 
uh, during the clips there, for example, from uh, si single parent families. Um, they, they uh, of course, that nature of that type of vulnerability may well be transient, uh, as, as, as it may be in other circumstances as well. Important to start broad before moving to narrow. Uh, lots, of, lots of things I can say about that, but essentially we understood or we tried to understand the background and, and the daily um, challenges of, of individuals before moving to the specific um, engagement with Wales and West Utilities in terms of planning, be as inclusive as possible, be as flexible as possible in, in your methodologies uh, and blending, methodolo blending methodologies. Involve the audience in design and research, including the carers. Talk to people who, whose daily lives um, involve uh, um, supporting people in these situations. Uh, use ethnographic as a slight grand term, but we went to them mostly, which meant that we could understand the reality of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the situations that um, many of the people we spoke to face, speak to professionals, as I've already talked about, involve family mem members and carers uh, where that's appropriate to do so um, and whether that, where that encourages engagement. Approach research with empathy, respect and understanding. It's important. Lots of things we can say about that. What I would say is for this programme of research, we used a team of only three researchers, all of whom were, uh, all of us were our experience, all of us who were authorised to kind of go off piste. We, it, it's, it's not going to work here if you have a structured questionnaire and stick to that come what may. You do need a, a license to, to, to roam effectively. Um, anxiety and its link, its link with emotional vulnerability is important both in terms of Wells and West Utilities operations but also in terms of the research and not putting too many pressures and demands on our respondents. We tried to be as empathetic uh, as we possibly could be and, and, and fit around their preferences and their needs. Uh, be prepared to reward respondents. As I said, we, we pay cash incentives in terms of analysing. We kind of triangulated. We viewed the insights we captured from the uh, uh, from the interviews with people in vulnerable situations, with the uh, kind of through the uh, a prism of, of the insights of the of the professional carers who, who support such individuals on, on a daily basis, um, and finally um, share client plans and responses with those who took part because that helps to valid, validate participation. For example, Wales and West Utilities publish reports on, on this program of vulnerability research, and we would signpost our respondents to those report so they could they could see that they took took, took part and, and their and their insights are making a difference um that's all for, all from me for now um uh, uh, th thank you for, for um, listening to me rattle through that very quickly. I urge you to, to download the, the, the guide, which gives you much more detail um, uh, at both the research and also um, some, uh, some, some thoughts on how best to go about it. Uh, thank you very, very much for listening. And, and at this point, I think I hand back to Louise. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Martin. Um, thanks very much for that. Fascinating to hear from some of those um, customers as well and uh, their own backgrounds. Um, I am keen that we'll have some time at the end for questions, so um, do send in any if you have them. Um, but next up, we're going to hear from Nigel Winnan from Wales and West Utilities. Nigel. Hello, folks. I uh, hope you can see my uh, slides. They're not showing up on my screen. Can, can everyone see them? No, okay, let me just uh, try again then. We can now see Sarah though, which is a big relief. Thank we you, can Sarah. See Sarah, which is great, okay. And I've got the slides on my screens. Hopefully you can now see them. Are they there, Louise? Yes, they're there, they're there. Great stuff, okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, take about 20 minutes or so just to respond to uh, what Martin's run through. Um, I'm the uh, Connections and Social Obligations Manager for uh, Wales and West Utilities. I've got the uh, best part of 30 years of oper operational experience now within uh, the gas industry. And what I would say is, you know, we've looking after vulnerable customers since I started in the business. Um, I think what this research has done really is open our eyes and perhaps get to think about it in, in a different way. Um, particularly some of the stuff around anxiety uh, and emotional impact is something that we perhaps hadn't fully considered uh, previously. Um, I'm going to pick out three key themes from what Martin's presented back. So one is around the uh, priority service register awareness. 
Secondly, around the emotional impact of our work and how we think we can do more around that. And thirdly, how we look to tailor our services to individual needs. What I would say is it has been the best part of two years, I guess, since Martin and his team first presented the early phase of this research back to us as we were going through our business planning. So we've had a lot of time to think about it. We've run a number of internal sessions with our um, customer facing staff and our operational colleagues. So we've done quite a bit already to implement the, uh, the findings, but we know we've got more to do. So if I start with the priority service register, um, important to remember that ourselves as well as most utilities don't maintain our own register. We pull information from the registers that the various gas suppliers maintain, and that there's the best part of 40 of those now uh, working across the UK. Um, but that data does inform and give us a good heads up of what we expect to find when we get into either an individual's home or an area. It's not always perfect, but it is a really good starting point. But we were really surprised that the lack of awareness of it, um, given that every time someone registers for uh, a gas supply contract, they should be getting asked by that gas supplier if they want to be on the party service register. Um, so we've taken a number of actions really to try and improve awareness of it. We've done some extensive training with our own staff, uh, our customer facing staff in the office, our engineers, and also third parties. I'll talk about that in a moment. We've developed uh, an app for our engineers. So if they come across someone on the doorstep and that customer doesn't believe it on the party service register, they're able to sign up via the mobile phone that the engineers have got. And we can then refer that person into the gas suppliers uh, register. We also always make sure we got formal, you know, proper consent from the customer to do that. We've developed a number of partnerships as well. And I think over the last two years, we've really stepped up our game on that. So we're now working with the likes of uh, Care and Repair Cymru. We work with Seven Fire and Rescue uh, Services, uh, which covers virtually all of our um, geography. We've got relationships with people like Warm Wales and the Centre for Sustainable Energy, who are a charity based in Bristol. And what all these people do is they have already got lots of, through their own work, they've come across lots of vulnerable people who perhaps we wouldn't come across because we only typically interrupt people's supplies once every 40 years. So they can reach out and find people that we wouldn't perhaps come across. And through their work, they can promote the priority service register. And again, either through forms or, or through uh, hopefully electronic means on our website, get a referral into us and we can get that off to the supplier. Um, conferences as well. We found this a really good source of particularly picking up the, the health workers. Martin's highlighted you know, that a lot of his research picked up with the carers, and we recognize those carers might all look after you know, 20, 30, we, we, we some of them have perhaps got 50 clients at any one time. You know, So by getting some knowledge through to them at the Priority Service Register, they can cascade that knowledge and, and look out for the people uh, in their care. Um, other people like occupational health uh, therapists as well have, have been quite a good source. And where they, they've all been very interested, they've taken away our literature, a number of those have asked for us to attend their local events and to provide some training to their, to their caseworkers. And then finally, what we've done, uh, particularly in the last year, and the, uh, the picture there is a snapshot of our um, current Facebook campaign that we've got ongoing. So Reese, who's our external affairs, um, expert in the business has worked with an organization we've now got a targeted facebook campaign and we do this by sort of looking at uh what people view um we can target it on a certain postcodes but demographics is the main thing so we are targeting this primarily around uh, people of pensionable age people with uh, serious illness but also people with young families with, with babies and, and children under five and that's been really successful. You'll see at the bottom there of the page that the combination of those various um, uh, initiatives means that we've moved from signing up around about three to 4,000 people to the Priority Service Register a year to a figure we got to 11,500 last year. So that's 11,500 people who weren't previously identifiable to uh, ourselves or to gas suppliers who are now on that register and will be picked up in the event of uh, not just a gas supply incident, but from the gas suppliers uh, perspective, thinking about social tariffs, thinking about the format of the billing, et cetera. The 
other really important thing that came through from the research was confusion really over people recognize that perhaps they were signed up but it might be on the electricity supply register or the water supply register um, so it came through really strongly you know, what, why isn't there one common register across the utilities so we've, we've moved on quite significantly with this over the last couple of years um, the, the top shows the, the historic situation really where the customer had to register with the gas supplier and we would see that information they would need to register with their electricity network and the, their electricity supplier and they would probably register separately with the, with the uh, water company but what we've done we've worked uh, across the industry initially with the electricity and then over the last 12 months with the, uh, the water industry so we've now got to a situation where the, the needs codes and the needs codes are where we can identify the actual individual vulnerability of someone is it just their pensionable age or is it they've got a serious illness? Are they deaf? Are they blind? Uh, they've got young children, et cetera. Those codes have now been harmonized across the three utilities. And we've managed to get some data sharing issues resolved. And this has been taken on board by Ofgem, the gas electricity regulator, and also uh, Ofwat, who regulate the water companies. And the, our license have been amended with an obligation to share this data. So um, we're now in a situation that if a customer registers with ourselves, we not only pass it to the supplier, we are passing that to the electricity network and we are passing it to the uh, relevant water company uh, who, who operate the, uh, the water network in that area as well. Uh, and vice versa, you know, if the electricity company get a referral, they'll pass it to the gas supplier, to the water companies and similar with the water companies. That's a real step forward. It's not one register, but it means that someone filling out a form will be recognised by all the utilities going forward. Um, I think the view going forward is one central place for this data to be held and maintained would be the ideal. That's a little way off, but I think that electricity are getting the same message from their stakeholders. So I think there is some momentum behind this. People like Citizens Advice as well, keen to support this uh, going forward. So watch the space on that one. I want to move on to the emotional impact of our work. So it came through really clearly. Uh, I do apologize if the slides are toggling. Mine keep jumping back to uh, a, a slideshow view rather than uh, whatever, but bear with me. I think what really came through was the emotional impact of our work. Um, what really came through from Martin's piece was that vulnerable people that he was talking to have some very set routines and whether that's just getting up and going to the shops on a daily basis or they've got visitors who come or there was a gentleman there who three times a week goes for treatment uh, health appointments and uh, he relies on a bus arriving at his door to take him to uh, those events so us turning up digging up the streets putting holes in their uh, paths etc to replace gas mains uh, their gas service or to deal with a, uh, a gas leak can be hugely disruptive to them. Um, so we've done a lot of work internally on with our staff about uh, emotion, uh, mental health wellbeing, and we've incorporated that into our training now when they're thinking about the customer in front of them. As I said, the product service register is a starting point. Until you actually get that person opening the door, you aren't exactly sure what you're gonna be faced with. So people need to be aware, need to be looking, need to be listening. It was quite clear that some of our communications weren't great either. You know, we, we had a tendency to perhaps think we were doing the right thing by sending out a notification of a planned work three months in advance. And then no one turns up on site for uh, weeks and months. And there was a gentleman that Martin had interviewed. I think he'd had a letter from us six months before. In the meantime, we deferred that job and we were going to do it at a later date. And that customer had worried for six months that someone was going to turn up disrupt his gas supply and what if he was out would his gas be off when he came out so we have reviewed our communication we have simplified it we've been through sort of crystal mark exercises we've made sure the language is suitable to be read and understood by uh, an 11 year old so i'm saying there are a huge number of people with uh, uh, learning um, challenges we send out that letter now one month before the work takes place and what we've done, we've invested in some customer support officers. So we had four in place already as we did this research. We sort of trialed them for some other reasons. But we've now got nine working across our network. So they, immediately after that letter's gone out, armed with data from the priority service register, they are knocking on the doors of people 
are showing their ID cards. We've got large fonts. We've got Braille on the back. We've got various uh, signed video apps and language line translation we can do to be prepared for whatever situation we come across. But what those customer support officers are really good at is forming some trust with that person, identifying a single point of contact, talking through what the works will involve, um, making sure that they know that they will receive further communication because although the street might be disrupted for a couple of months, the likelihood is their gas is only going off for a few hours. But that could be quite significant to people. So understanding, do they need us to provide some alternative appliances? Do they need some heating? Do they need an alternative form of cooking? And again, what is the most suitable? I think the, what's the, the COVID situation has shown us in the last few weeks is that Perhaps what we've done traditionally, just giving someone a fan heater. Yes, it provides warmth, but it's a very dry heat. And for someone who has a chest condition or has had some COVID symptoms or is recovering from it, that's not a good thing for their, their chest and their lungs. So something like an oil-filled radiator is actually a better solution for them. It's not the easiest thing to do. They take up a lot more space on the vans. But by identifying that front, we can make sure that person's got that appliance the day the gas goes off. Those customer support officers have also been really valuable in allowing us to restart our works after the initial lockdown across the UK by being able to contact people, to give them assurance about the steps we would take, to understand if people were shielding and do our utmost to avoid any interruption to that person's supply, um, but to assure them about the precautions we would take, including, as you can see in the picture there, face masks, uh, gloves, um, wiping down surfaces after we've actually finished our work, asking people to vacate the immediate area in another room while we're undertaking our works. And that's allowed us to complete probably well over 95% of the work that we have planned for this year with a very small amount of work deferred and, and, and other solutions put in place. Like I say, that, that single point of contract is, is really important. Those people leave their contact details uh, with the most vulnerable customers. And they'll take phone calls from at any time in the day or the evening. If someone's really uncertain about what's happening, they've perhaps forgotten what's going on. We've, in the process of developing cards, been trying again, try and make those simple. We're working with people like the uh, uh, Dementia uh, UK, Dementia Friends, to understand what's the best thing to actually leave with someone that they'll understand and, and give them a, a reminder about the gas works going on in the area. And then we're also conscious that we need to perhaps just close the loop on that. So again, the customer support office is going around, following up calls after the work finishes. See if there's anything else we can offer if everything, the customer's understood what's happened and everything's been put back okay for them. Customer support office is a bit of a luxury. Ideally, for, works really well on our planned work, not necessarily so well on our emergency work, where we might get a call and we've got to be on site within an hour. That's where the training of our engineers has come in by making them more aware of the uh, the, these um, uh, emotional impacts of the work. Again, we've done lots of work to develop cards and simplified information that we can leave with the customer because the formal safety notices that the health and safety executive require are hugely complicated. And that links in really with making sure that we tailor our services to the individual need. It's very easy to have a tick box exercise here to say, well, we've got an obligation in our license to provide alternative heating and cooking. We've left that fan heater, tick in the box, off we go. Uh, we've done everything right. But by able to actually engage with people ahead of the works, we can identify if there's other support measures they might need. Some of those people who are really susceptible to the cold, we've developed things like keep warm packs now that might have blankets or, or gloves in there. So despite the, the gas being off and us providing alternative heating, the temperature might be colder than normal. Um, we've got heated seat covers that we've developed through an innovation. We found a local supplier who uh, provides covers that we can put over, over armchairs. They plug in and they keep that customer warm during the, during the works. Obviously, we can absolutely look to absolutely minimise the duration of the interruption. But it isn't obviously just the gas disruption, as we talked about. It's making sure that person can get in and out of their home, um, whether that's they've got a mobility scooter or they're just uh, with a, a walking stick. Um, we've developed various ramps to make sure people can get up and down curbs properly. And it's just an awareness of the team on site that, you know, perhaps there is a bus that comes three times a week to pick up an individual. And it's vital that we actually maintain access to that home for that bus to come so the person can get to their appointments. So the tailoring of individual services 
is more and more important. And as Martin said, some of these things are hugely complicated. The priority service register might show that someone is a principal age. I've seen cases where there's multiple um, needs codes recorded against the customer. But that's not always the case. You, know, you really need to look and, and discuss with the person, understand what their needs are. And absolutely, as, as per Martin's research, um, we've got to concentrate on our core activities. But we have got those relationships with other partnerships. We have got uh, money through our regulatory settlement to do more. So we can do things such as tackling fuel poverty, giving some energy efficiency advice, and also raising the awareness of gas safety and carbon monoxide. So once we've built that trust and we've looked after the customer during our initial works, they're much more likely to accept a referral to one of our partner organizations. And we've had some real good success in trying things over the last couple of years with people like Warm Wales and the Centre for Stable Energy, where they've been able to engage with that household and they've identified benefits they're not claiming. They've helped to address um, utility debt and where there's wider debt, refer on to other organizations who are specialized with that. Make sure people are on the right tariffs, give them energy efficiency advice, and also link them up with where there is funding for measures. So in Wales, for example, the Welsh government have got a scheme called NEST, the British Gas Run, that can provide funding to replace perhaps a, a broken or uh, end of life uh, gas boiler or to insulate the loft space, making a huge difference to people. So over the last two years, we have helped best part of 2000 homes um, with an average saving in the first year to them of about 500 pounds. And some of those benefits go on for years and years, such as if you identify a benefit they should be on or when you clear a debt, that's an impact on that household for years and years. And we're keen to carry on doing that stuff going forward. Just to wrap up then, before uh, we go into some questions, what next? Um, being a gas transporter, we don't have a database of all the customers. Like I say, that sits with the gas suppliers, they're the people who send the, uh, the bills out to people on a regular basis. We can pull some limited information, but we certainly haven't had access in the past to any phone numbers or email addresses, et cetera. But learning from the electricity industry, who've had that, that access for a number of years now and have said it's made a huge change to the way they can deal with customers on emergencies and uh, during their plan works. We will now be able to access gas suppliers' contact details um, through uh, an organization called Exaserve. And Exaserve sort of glue together all the services, if you like, between ourselves, the gas suppliers, and the people who, who operate the, the, the gas meters. Um, so, for, once we've sent that letter out to customers, we'll be able to then follow up with um, periodic texts and emails to people to give them updates on the project. Our customer service officers will be coming along. People can opt out if they don't want to receive those uh, those texts. And, and again, in the case of an emergency, we'll be able to send a broadcast message to that uh, area um, saying what's going on. You might say that's not new. Get that from my water company all the time. But for us, it is new because we've never had access to those details. Um, demographic mapping is something we want to do more on. Um, we've got a really good uh, graphical system where we've got all our pipes, et cetera. And we want to pull in a lot of the data that is available from the uh, ONS uh, and other data sets so that when we look at an area, we can understand what the demographics are. Um, you know, have we got a challenge there with a large portion of people who perhaps English isn't their first language, or we've got a very elderly population, or perhaps it's a young population with a school. Uh, in, in the media area as well. That'll help us to inform our communications, the planning of our projects much better than we do at the moment with all that data being in diverse systems. So a bit of an innovation project that we're planning uh, starting early part of next year to bring that into our data with some analytics alongside it. And finally, the uh, enhanced engagement with trusted partners. Uh, again, it came through from some of that research um, and it's really just a matter of starting to tabulate a bit of a sort of database really when we go into an area who, who are the carers um who are the gp surgeries community police for example counselors so we can use those people to make them aware of our works they can help to reassure their clients that, it, that we're genuine especially with all the issues around scams uh, at the moment uh we can send them again the regular updates of those projects and, and help them to 
give a really good joined up service uh, to the customers in that area. Okay, so that is me. Um, I think we're going to move into, if I stop showing, so that should have stopped my slides. Is that okay? It has. Thank you, Nigel. Well, okay. Thank you. Some tangible um, examples of how you put the research into practice. Now, we are going to have some um, questions. Um, one, and you mentioned this, so I'm going to go to you um, first on it, Nigel, is um, from Rianne Haynes, Community Support Worker, Warm Wales. They say uh, one issue they wish to raise is how customers um, who find it difficult to engage with the utility sector if they don't have online access and reliant on being in lengthy queues on the telephone. Now, I can assure you it's not just vulnerable customers. Lots of people find, especially at the moment during COVID, when they've been trying to contact their suppliers, etc., they're in these long telephone queues. And how do you um, support or help um, people like that who may not have online access? We, um, I say, we, I, I don't think that ourselves experience particularly long queues. We make sure we resource our, our uh, call centre during the day. We, we, we offer an eight to eight service on Saturday mornings, and we make sure that we've got capacity on our call centre to take calls. We've got overspill with other teams as well. Um, we've got forms on the website that people can complete as well. So rather than hanging on, they've got the option to fill in a form and we'll arrange a call back for them at the appropriate time. Uh, people can write to us, they can email us. Um, so we're very conscious that, you know, not all people are digitally engaged out there. I think on the stats that Sarah showed, you know, like half a million people in our network who've have not got access or just don't use the internet. Um, it is a challenge. We, we've got our, uh, we, we pride ourselves on having a, the British standard for inclusive service provision. So we're really focused on this at the moment, especially our audits coming up in a month's time. Um, the suppliers, um, we do hear a lot more cases, and certainly when we try and contact the suppliers for query, we do find it a challenge. We have got some sort of contact names within their sort of vulnerability teams to sort of bypass that and to try and help customers along the line. But it is something I think Offgem are, are very focused on, uh, understanding that issue, and other charities, people, people like the um, National Energy Action, recognise these challenges, that things that, that service needs to get better. Please, can I add something? Yes. All right. Sorry to interrupt, but um, I think it's just it's a really important point. And as recently as yesterday, I was talking with our stakeholder engagement team about this exact issue and about, um, you know, we've heard all the great stuff from Martin about how we've engaged in people's homes. So obviously digital engagement is not an issue then, but with COVID, absolutely, it is a much more important issue. So um, in the ongoing research engagement, we're going to do that's exactly one of our focus areas, which is how do we contact and engage with people, probably on the telephone actually, to find out how not only what what how do we provide good service to them, but how do they want to be communicated with. So a little step away from the question, perhaps, but I think it's absolutely one of our focus areas is how do we reach those harder to reach people that we can't reach digitally. No, that's really interesting. And Sarah, I was going to come to you next anyway. Because um, Nigel mentioned in his um, presentation about nine customer support officers, which is fantastic, um, but he did say himself, and I'm quoting him, a bit of a luxury. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, people might say in a time like this when costs are being compressed, we see people losing jobs, <clears throat> etc. Would people see the step you're taking as a bit of a luxury, or do you think this is absolutely essential to ensure that people are, are um, included and not, not left out and are able to engage and able to um, support the most vulnerable? Yeah, I mean, it is it is interesting and it's something we've kept under review, but the results of our sort of guys on the ground and our customer support officers have been so important, particularly in this area of vulnerability, that I think it's something that we're really keen to, to continue. I mean, absolutely, the financial challenges that everybody's under, but, you know, we're in our uh, regulatory review at the moment. That's There's going to be pressure on, on um, investment in this type of area. But I think as part of our regulatory business plan, we've made some very firm commitments to our customers on the back of this type of research about what our commitments are. So I won't go over them again, but the things like the PSR that Nigel's talked about. And, and, and I think what that does is make our approach to tailoring our services 
and making sure we do invest in the right areas for the very the most vulnerable and those hardest to reach even more important than ever so and, and that that whole engagement piece i just referred to will carry on it's not a one hit wonder piece of research and then and then we we forget it and move on but we'll keep talking to customers carers and and all the um the uh, groups that have been referred to through this to inform and shape um, our investment because bit, pretty much every penny counts, doesn't it? I know it's a bit of an obvious thing to say. Um, but actually, a couple of new things that haven't been mentioned that we've brought in as well. Um, we've got a customer engagement group, which is an, ex an external independent group, which really holds us to account. Are we doing what our customers have asked for? So it's very focused on customers. And new for our new regulatory um, cycle is a citizens panel, which we'll be recruiting shortly. So actually really regularly engaging with with consumers that use our services. We always thought that people using our services wouldn't know very much about energy or wouldn't be that interested as a bit of a general broad brush comment, but absolutely it's not been the case in any engagement we've done. People have been really interested to learn more, uh, take the time to educate themselves and then really have some meaningful conversations about how we can support them. So yes, there will be financial challenges, but it makes our role even more important, I think. Yeah, and I think that's um, really important, the customer engagement piece more than anything, really, because, you know, if you're not hearing back from the customers about what they want, then how can you take the right steps? Um, and as you say, I mean, I was fascinated, Nigel, with some of the comments you made about saving customers quite significant sums of money. Um, and perhaps for the most vulnerable, they've been in a position where they've been overpaying, um, et cetera, for a long time. So that. Uh, I was going to say, you know, it, it's perhaps not our core service, but I, I think what we've um, ourselves and other stakeholders have managed to do is convince Ofgem that there is value. You know, we are different from gas suppliers in that probably no one's ever had a representative of their gas supplier in their home unless they service their boilers. You know, we do go into people's homes either through repa replacing pipes or through gas emergencies or doing air connections work. So we do have that engagement with people. Uh, like I say, we don't pretend we're the best place for people to do it, which is why we partner with organisations who've got track records of doing this. We put funding in, we help support their training. Th those partners got to take a huge amount of credit for, for those achieving those savings. I think that's really important as well, isn't it? Sort of to have these partnerships with other organisations um, where you can sort of out, reach out to people who you may not have been meeting before because you know what annoys people most is when they're sort of working in silos and they try and call you and you say oh that's not us go and speak to someone else and they feel they get passed around and there's no sort of joined up thinking so I think it can be helpful if you are able to show that there is sort of partnership work going on there. Um, uh, Martin the report puts a, a really heavy focus on emotional vulnerability um, why do you think it's important to make the distinction, if you like, and how uh, should this impact the way that um, the, the organisation of UWU would, would support vulnerable customers? Um, thanks, Louise. Uh, emotional vulnerability was something of a surprise for us because at the outset of the research, we essentially recruited on the eligibility criteria for the for the priority census register and also we had we had a, a view to what Ofgem said about uh, what constitutes vulnerability. But very, very clear, very soon it was clear that um, when we're recruiting people on the basis of a tangible or a, or a physical um, vulnerability, sometimes illness or disability, uh, often this, this was overlaid with emotional uh, vulnerability and the two were interlinked. And the, in a sense, the emotional vulnerability uh, and often that manifests itself as anxiety would have just as big, bigger an impact on the way that Wales and West Utilities would have to consider the needs of that customer and the circumstances and their, 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 their visible and, and their physical tangibility so, uh, vulnerabilities. So, for example, let, let me give you some, some thinking about that. And Nigel actually alluded to it. Um, lots of um, discussion about communications ahead of planned work, um, when that should happen, what form that should, uh, uh, what form that should take. Uh, some issues uh, emotional vulnerability drew out of that where not only um, do organisations like Wales and West Utilities need to think about how clearly to communicate that, they need to think about when to communicate it, actually what to say and in what level of detail. 
for example, if you communicate it too far ahead, Nigel said we had individuals who were who were worried because it would disrupt their, their, their daily routine, even if it was six months into the future. If it didn't say enough about what was uh, what was planned, uh, people would have concerns, which would again play on their anxiety about actually what would what would be entailed on the day and what what would be demanded of them. If it gave too much information, uh, again they, they, they would they would they would have concerns uh, about uh, all, all of the information they would be being presented. With with what they have to do. So very, very quickly, it was clear that emotional vulnerability wasn't a category of vulnerability in itself. It was often overlaid, uh, sometimes was uh, was related or consequential to, 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 to the vulnerabilities that we created on, on the basis of. So um, it was surprising to us and we really wouldn't want to uh, underplay uh, its significance in terms of as much utilities need to think about. Thank you very much. Now, I'm conscious of time, so just a couple of quick last ones. Um, uh, Nigel, I think this one's for you, really. Uh, another focus of the report was on carbon monoxide safety. What is the BWU doing to address this important issue? So, yeah, carbon monoxide, uh, you know, is associated with you know, fossil burning appliances, not burning it properly and creating carbon monoxide, uh, a gas that can lead to some serious issues or, or, or death so we've done a lot of work over the last uh five six years in trying to raise awareness we, we started off going out to uh things like the royal welsh show the bath and west show with a, with a, a sort of model um flat if you like and getting people to spot the, the the challenges and we got lots of awareness and lots of monitors issued out to people but we soon realized actually probably need to focus our money and our efforts at those, again, those really vulnerable people, hard to reach, and not people who turn up at the shows. So that is where our relationships with people at the Fire and Rescue Service have developed, because they already do home visits for people, they do the fire safety checks, give them, give them smoke alarms, by being able to sort of top up their funding, by giving them a number of alarms to dish out to people, they're able to raise awareness on every half, the alarms to the right people. And all the battery alarms, they've got a, a sort of eight year lifetime on them, they can be set up in the right place. Same with care and repair agencies. Um, but again, lots of campaigns online looking to uh, reach people. Again, very much around the digital uh, side of things. Warm Wales, again, spreading the message on the back of the stuff they've been doing around the tariffs, giving them advice. Got to be careful with leaflets, you know, they can end up in the bin, but making them clear, simple, something that's in the drawer, a, a good, uh, good thing. Um, and the other thing we've done is a lot of stuff around schools as well. So think about the sort of younger generation, um, the power to pester parents, and they are the future uh, users of gas. So we, Sarah's team have done lots of stuff. We've got a number of gas ambassadors in the business. And prior to the COVID piece, we were going out to school. We reached about, I think, 2,000 pupils last year through something called a safety Seymour thing. So we go up with a little, little bear, and we have the adventures of the bear, and how he identifies and tackles safety Seymour. There's, activities for the kids to complete this is at primary school children and that's that's been really successful it's not just us all the gas network in the uk are doing this and we're now looking at how we develop that to older children and people also go off to university for the first time experience perhaps living in a house of their own and make sure they don't do silly things in creating an issue so we've done lots we've got lots of plans we've got some Good plans. I think we're looking at doing props as a wider piece across the gas industry with suppliers and the people who have the appliances. So what have some sort of national campaigns over the next couple of years, I think. Thank you very much indeed. Um, a quick last question to you, Sarah. Um, this is, you know, it's fascinating research. Um, but, you know, I've worked in policy long enough to know that research can kind of be read and shoved on the shelf and forgotten about. Um, what sort of guarantees can you give that you are, this is not a one-off, there's something you're going to be constantly looking at um, to ensure that the most vulnerable are, are protected? Yeah, well, look, I mean, not only, not only is it really important to us as an organisation, as it has been since we were set up in 2005, this is not something we've just started doing. Um, we um, are looking also at, as I said, at our business plan and, and we've made commitments in there. So not only have we committed to our regulator, but we've committed to the consumers that we've engaged with throughout that. And, and those are written down and, and, and they're there for people to hold us account to. But, but yeah, look, it isn't just about a regulatory um, 
deliverable for us. This is something, you know, customer service is extremely important to us. As Nigel said, you know, two of our very flagship accreditations are with the Institute of Customer Service and the Vulnerable um, Service Inclusion accreditation that Nigel referred to earlier. And, and at the very highest level, um, you know, we review these things regularly as an exec team, present them to our, our board. But, but actually, it's much more, it's more than that. It's in our DNA. And, and I know, again, that maybe sound a bit of a flippant thing to say, but our people take this seriously. And, and actually, the people that hold us as a senior team to account are our own people, the people that go into homes every day, that see vulnerable people in, in their situations that come to us and say, can't we do more? We can't always do more because, as Nigel said at the beginning, or I think it was Martin, maybe, you know, we can't step on the toes of social services, but our people, you know, see people in the most vulnerable of situations day in, day out. So, uh, you know, we all are, are in our organisation feel responsible to keep delivering, keep listening and, uh, and keep evolving and shaping our service. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone who dialed in today for this webinar. It's great to be on board. Uh, thank you to our panel, Martin Oliver, Nigel Whitten, and Sarah Hopkins. Uh, on behalf of Cicero, thank you for joining us today. I hope you found it interesting. And I'm going to give Sarah the last word. Thank you, Louise. Uh, look, um, just to echo uh, Louise's points, really, I hope you found today uh, interesting. I hope you've um, learned something new, perhaps, and uh, maybe this can uh, help to shape your thinking with, with this new insight um, and about not only what we've told you about our findings, but about how you might engage with the most vulnerable customers in your communities. My thanks also to Louise and Cicero for facilitating us, to Martin and his colleagues at Mindset for supporting us uh, over the last number of years with, uh, with this project, and to Nigel and all my colleagues behind the scenes that uh, have made this work today so we'll be sending a, a feedback form to you after the, the um, webinar is finished and of course a download link uh, for our guide as well we are filming um, I think some of today's um, webinar so there'll also be a short film I believe made available uh, and circulated in the next uh, in, in the next few days if you want to know more about us or get uh, involved um, with us then please think about signing up to our stakeholder newsletter or if you want to collaborate with us we'd love to hear from you and have conversations about how we can you know create this real joined up approach to vulnerable customers and supporting them so if you want to do either of those things if you could uh, email us at engagement at www.utilities.co.uk one of the team will get in touch thanks very much for your participation I hope you have a nice day and please stay safe uh, in your various lockdowns thank you thank you very thank much you everybody